McDonald's Spicy Chicken McNuggets are back. Are they spicy? You bet your McNuggets. Now, buy one four-piece Spicy Chicken McNuggets and get a second four-piece for a dollar. Spicy Chicken McNuggets are breaded with tempura and spiced with aged cayenne seasoning. They pack a lot of heat, and they're back. For a limited time, wash them down with a refreshing Dr. Pepper. Only at McDonald's. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Welcome to another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright and welcome back, Jared Johnson. Welcome. Good morning. Good, good morning. Good morning indeed. Now, we've come together to talk about your 2009 film, Tony, after uh, after such a good chat about Muscle, your most recent film. It's one I've always wanted to, to talk to you about, myself personally, because I've been, I've been lived in London since 2000 and a lot of my time in London was spent around sort of Dalston and Shoreditch. I remember the first time I watched your film, it was a bit like a social documentary of, of parts of London that I ungrounded, and I just couldn't believe that someone had made it into a horror film. And, and, and then looking at it with 2022 eyes, it's, it is really like a social history document of a Dalston that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, and even at that time, it had... It, it had moved on so so much to, you know, the late nineties or the or how I remember how I really remember it when it was like you know you had Brick Lane and you had just there was the Clifton or a couple of Indian restaurants and and that was it you know what I mean mm. there was no and then go, and then but yeah looking looking back to how it is now compared to then mm. is amazing you know with the bendy buses and everything else and everything's changed. And not only Dalston, Soho as well is unrecognisable. Soho and King's Cross Station. Yeah, there's, King's there's, Cross. There's a few. There's a few wide shots of King's Cross Station that that's not it. Yeah. Doesn't look like anything like that anymore. No, no, massive change. Um, yeah, massive change in that period. So, 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 it's, so that's exciting about the film anyway, because like you know, films shot in London tend to be about the iconic buildings of London, like, you, you know, and they're the buildings that don't really ever change, but you really get us down to street level with Tony. And I think even between the short that you made in 2005 called Tony, you know, the images of Old Street Roundabout, like you've, you've really got all the scaffolding up that was the, that's the, the, the tumultuous change that's about to happen in that area. You know, the bloody yeah. tech centre of London and all that kind of stuff hadn't happened in 2005. Yeah. I think that's the, you know, the, the thing that I'm fascinated in is always location, um, F- filming on location, you know, yeah. getting out on the streets. Yeah. It's like the stuff that I, I grew up loving was always, you know, stuff of, of New York in the seventies or, or, um, you know, Paris, you know, just, just on, on the street. So I think there was that fascination of not seeing it as much in a lot of London films. Um, you know, there's examples, but I, but I, but I, I'm always fascinated, you know, by, films that really capture that time, capture mm. a certain period in time. And you can only really do it because obviously we look at period stuff now. Yeah. And, you know, CGI has come in, uh, in, into the fore for, for certain things. But still, when you look at period stuff, there's something slightly amiss um, when they try to recreate, because a lot of the time they overdo it, overcompensate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so all of the cars... Like if they're f- setting a film in 1972, all of the cars will be from 1972. Yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. There'll be no like 1950s cars still on the so. So <clears throat> trying to, yeah, and, and and I think the thing with Tony, um, again, what was so, why, why it was so special was that I it was obviously my first feature, mm. and it, it it was a short before, but with, with the feature I. I had a certain set of, um, not, I, I won't say demands because that sounds too, but I, I had certain things that I just really wanted it to be, mm. um, certain things I wanted to do, which one was shooting on film, um, two was shooting chronologically, um, 
three was like I was left alone with the writing of it. It was a very closed environment um, where it was just me and the actors workshopping for for a number of months. Mm. And no one was allowed to see the script. Not even the other actors could see the script outside of their uh, character. You know, so what? What was the importance of that to you in in the process? Just because, Ed, so everyone was approaching Tony. I mean, obviously, the importance of keeping it away from uh, the financiers, yeah, uh, was important at, at that point because obviously, what we were doing was, and again, like to going back to how we went from uh, the short to the feature. So Paul Abbott. Um, I, I, Paul Habert, Habert had seen one of my short films. Um, I'd invited him to see Tony when I made the, the short of Tony. Mm. And the next day he called me into the office, his office, and said, look, I think we could get the money to make this into a feature. Mm. And, and it was, he was going to put in 20K and the film council, the, the idea was to go to the film council and say, can you match it? Um, the film council, which is now the BFI. Yeah. So it, it, it again, it was a small amount of money, but obviously compared to what the money I was making my shorts for, mm. it seemed like a huge amount. Right. Okay. You know, and we I, I, and and we had like eleven days, eleven days to shoot this film. Blimey, O'Reilly. And on film as well. So that 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 dictated. Anyway, I use a long workshop process, but this was really long. This was really organic, you know, where I had a general idea of stuff uh, mm. with Tony, but it was very much driven by um, me and the actors in a workshop environment. And it was such a fun period, um, the, the development of that. So when, when you, you know? so, so when you start the workshopping of it, I mean, you've made the short, just was the short made with workshopping in its development. Yeah, I've always yeah, I've always used um that that um process, yeah. But obviously for for the film it suddenly became re- I mean I mean for the shorts, you know, it would have been around someone's front room, but for the film it was suddenly like okay, we've got an office for this, we've got a camera there, you know, everything's set up, we've got scripts printed out. Mm. You know, we could use all of uh, Paul Abbott and tightropes um, you know, it felt like it was, well, it was our own little production company in 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 Soho. So right. that was that felt incredibly uh, liberating and um, to to actually be taken seriously. I think that's that that was that was the the point you get to where you know you make your shorts and you get into a few film festivals. Um, but then yeah, it became a, a huge step up, but. What was good as well was that I had no real fear of 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 that, um, and that I keep saying it was very liberating. And I mean, every every it would never, and I've said this to you before, mm. I, it would never happen that way again. Right? You know how we made that film; mm. it would never happen again. So, at its, so in a way, at its own energy momentum. That yeah, and just just the fact that you know I was left alone to create this world. And, you know, uh, to write a script, I say it's a script, but it was um, it was a document rather than a script. It was in a script format. Obviously, it was mm. like final draft and everything else, but it was very, and I think a lot of that, it, it, it was half of half of the, the, the way I wanted to shoot, who I was inspired by, how I wanted to do it. But also there was insecurities there of, of you know, showing a script uh, to people, you know, since, since, as I say, like since writing stuff like Hyena, which took like three years of research and, 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 you know, hundreds and hundreds of drafts, um, you realize like when I look back at the Tony document, <laughs> like it's such a, it's such a sort of, it is a script, but it's not, if you know what I mean. I mean, I mean, what, I mean, I mean, it's well, not, that's I- what, that's what created such a such a unique original little film because there were no rules. There was no one saying, no, 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 you need to have this happen at the third act. You need to do this. You need to do this. No one was telling me anything. So out of it came this great 
cult little film, you know, that's, mm. that's, 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 that's um, just a unique energy all of its own. I guess, I guess um, at this point, we probably should say that uh, for those surprisingly who might have come along for this ride who haven't seen it, Tony, Tony is a sort of almost like a biopic of a, of a, fic- of a fictional serial killer because it's, it's, it's his point of view. We're not, we're not trying to catch a killer. This isn't, this isn't Sl- Sans the Lambs or, or Zodiac. This is from the killer's point of view. But also, it's not a slasher film. It's not a sort of hunt and kill film either. It is, it is the, the, <laughs> the life and times of a man killing in East London, which makes it a really fascinating watch because on the one hand, you do have that brut- brutality, the ruthlessness, the cruelty, and the violence of a, of a serial killer film. But also you may, you've given us a character who is compelling because it's him against the world <laughs> in, in another sense. He, he, he's, he's surviving in almost like, he's almost been cut adrift from society, not just because he's a psychopath. I mean, that might, that obviously leak, that's probably a, a great deal of it, but, but he's not inhuman in everything he does. And that's kind of what you, oh. you, you dig into as much as, I mean, we're, yeah. you know, it's not high on kills. This isn't, you know, the, the thrill kill watcher isn't going to watch this, but, but the sort of pe- person looking for what a dark character is, will will find that, yeah, they have light moments. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, it was, it was a, it was all about trying to show, um, have an understanding of why Tony is the way he is, you mm. know, rather than rather than it being too blatant. And I think I remember us talking about it before, and um, I had it was at one point I put some some very subtle sound design in there of Tony's dad. Yeah, yeah. I, I asked you about exposition, yeah. but there isn't any. And you yeah. go, yeah, there is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was so. And again, it was like because it was my first feature. Um, we were doing all sorts of stuff in the in the sound edit. Um, but, you know, there's that thing. I, I should have been more bold and, and, and maybe raised the levels somewhat. But, I, I, yeah, I, as well, it's like you, you're making it for like 5.1 cinema screen. And, you know, once once people are watching it on whatever they're watching it on, that that, that sort of sound design, that, that uh, gets lost. Um, but when you're looking but for yeah. it, Jared, it's it's, it's there. It's there, and then yeah, the, yeah. the the big one, oh, no. the big the big part of it is high in the mix actually. But the, yeah. until you told me, I just because I of, because of what we're watching, you're watching a policeman stood at the door, and your mind is elsewhere. But at that point, yeah, at that cool. cut, the audio goes, "Don't you fucking speak to me like that yeah, or yeah, something?" Yeah. You know, it's like so. It's clearly another voice that's in Tony's head, but yeah, because of the narrative that's panning out. You're not really as concerned as what's going on. You're just wondering. I mean, it's again. This is the magic of the film. It's like for some reason, and maybe, maybe I'm, I'm alone, but I don't think I am. You're worried about Tony getting caught, which is a ridiculous idea for watching a film about a killer. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it gives you at every point you un- you understand the reasons for what he's doing. Mm. You know, he's not he's not just going out and willfully killing people or knocking people off. It's, you know, he invites people around. He wants to look after them. He wants to make them fish fingers and chicken nuggets and put on John Beans Van Damme film. Beans yeah, on Beans toast, on a bit of Paul Young. And then, and then someone will do something that, that slightly upsets him because they think that he's easily manipulated. And, um, you know, once he's pushed, it's the only, it's the only way he can retaliate. Mm. You know, so 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 I think everyone that comes into the flat. I mean, for instance, Dawn comes in and he's he he loves Dawn. Mm. You know, he's not at all aggressive, but you know the junkies were quite aggressive. Well, the junkie there put his a, foot on the coffee table, didn't he? Yeah, that's kind of like the well, first. One step. Of, one, to be honest, one of them was was um, not very nice, but the other one he let go, who was who was nicer to him. Mm. So there's always there was always a reason. Obviously, the TV license guy. Um, and uh, I remember at that time I was getting loads of, um, I just, I'd getting loads of, um, letters from the TV licensing, um, people 
<laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So you thought you, uh, that, that was front and centre of your mind when you're thinking who could knock yeah, on the door yeah. next? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I'd, I'd paid the, the license fee, and they still were sending and saying, you know, this property is showing that there is no that you're li- illegally watching, and it's like. Yeah, I remember it being just um, an annoyance at the time, so I thought I'd put that in. Well, I mean, you've sort of hinted at it in the way you describe how it's written, um, that it wasn't, you know, it couldn't be done like this way before because you weren't being told about Acts 1, 2 well, and 3 and, and somebody well, monitoring. I mean, yeah, it's just, it, yeah, it's just not even being told, but just that the process that you have on every single other film or, or TV show um, where... You know, it's it goes through the notes process. Um, so, so, so in that sense, how did you process. and how did you then, with that workshop approach, what were the challenges for you without without that notes interference? Then, what did you find was the most challenging aspect of developing it to be the film you shot? That then, once it was edited, that's where you began to get your notes. But, but for you, what do you remember being the challenge in creating the Tony story, even without the influence of notes? Well, no, it's so it, 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 it was always a case of, of of wanting to do a slice of life, wanting to do like a Henry, but very much Henry was a certain, this was trying to tackle, make Tony a completely different character. So it became like, what if, you know, the, the normal, the social realism we used to seeing with Ken Loach and Mike Lee and Alan Clark, what, what if it was from the perspective of the serial killer in that environment, you know, mm. an environment of East London, so we're tackling those issues, but it's it's very much it's it's from a character's perspective we're not used to spending any time with, and hopefully I understand. Well, I'll say hopefully understanding like I'm defending, but it, there was obviously a lot of um, abuse that went on with Tony, hence why he became so uh, slipped through the net and then became violent because of it. Mm. So it's not trying to. It's not trying to, um, you know, I don't know, um, trying to stick up for for someone who's who's quite a nasty person, but trying to understand those situations. Um, and then I think with the sh- I think with the short film, it wasn't necessarily the humour wasn't really um, coming out of it as much. Mm. And then when, <laughs> once we did the film, it became very black. I think if you'd have gone one way of developing it, you could have made it quite serious and po-faced, but it it felt so much stronger um, with a, you know, black streak of comedy going, going through. Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, Smudger and, Smudger and Mackie, I mean, you could you could do a spin-off film on them too, I think. Yeah, there's them, and then there's, you know, the Ricky Grover the characters. Ricky Ro- yeah. yeah. I mean, he's Ricky's sort of playing against type, um, but then you've got like this, the, 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 the dialogue, the sunbed scenes, and it's like that uncomfortable, um, you know, horrible humour, really. Um, I mean, I've seen it in, I mean, uh, Julian Richards did a film called Last Horror Movie, which is a guy who basically tapes on the end of a higher, I mean, it doesn't work, it doesn't work as much now, but in the video age, he would follow someone home who's just hired a film, kill him, put the, edit the kill onto the film, and then take the video back. And so the film would have this spliced cut into it of a of the last right. person who had it, murdered it. But there's a scene around the table where you know he's the killer and he's with his sister. And you're 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 laughing at him, goading his nephew, and she's telling him to behave himself and don't, you know, you're awful, you are. And it's like, and we all we the audience are going, you don't know how awful he is. <laughs> You know, like the joke is, you don't know how awful he is. Like in the same way that like, say, Neil Maskell's job centre character, he's almost got complete disdain. Oh, he has got, got complete disdain for him. And he and, yeah. and, and when his te- phone on his text goes and he checks it and he laughs and then he yeah, returns yeah, attention yeah. back to him and he's like, you're in the, you're looking at a killer here, mate, and you don't know it. And that, that's the <laughs> joke. That's the joke, the, the dark yeah. joke, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, yeah, but going back to your point of, like, how how do you, you know, what are you looking at to make this into a feature? It just came, it just became so 
um, easy to. I mean, there was lots of there were scenarios that didn't make it into the film. There was characters that that didn't make it. You know, so we. But it was always about Tony around London, existing in this world, mm. and you know, coming meeting people. As you know, I was very influenced by the, the Dennis Nielsen story. That's that was that was something that stayed with me as a kid, mm. and I was always fascinated with with, with that story of. of at the killing for company side, you know, yeah, the yeah, killing yeah, yeah. because he didn't want he didn't want people to leave. So he was obviously very influenced. On, he was he was he was his personality wasn't, but his his look and his modus was yeah. very much based on on Dennis Nilsson. You know, yeah, yeah, because um, you got you even go as far, you go as far as the whiting up of the face and everything, the whole corpse, whiting up of the face. Actually, that is in the yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, it's more. Exactly. It's more evident in the short, isn't it? Because in the short, you well, see. Well, I did the, the I did the masturbation scene, but we yeah. didn't want to do it in the in the feature. It felt too, it felt too um, on the nose. Really, um, I didn't want to do it again. So, but the white the white talc should sort of symbolise that's what he's been doing in the other room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then obviously the you know going to gay pubs and and bars and and picking guys up. Um, so we were lucky enough to go in the joiners, use the joiners before it's, I mean, it's gone now, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. we went in there, like we, we started filming it there like six, seven in the morning after a Saturday night. So that did you really, it was, well, it was, you know, again, like, I bet the aroma was sweet bike. at that time of the day. It, it was indeed. It was indeed. It was lots of, um, lots of goings, lots of shenanigans going on, but um, it was, you, you know, on a, on a budget like that, it's hard to get extras. It's hard to get all this stuff. So it's like let's just let's just go in. Let's just go in the joiners, and you know, everyone will want to stay because it's kicking out time. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's like, yeah, do you want? Look, you can go, or do you want to stay for another couple of hours and carry on drinking? And you can be in a film. <laughs> so, so all all of those characters in the background, they're all. Or oh, most of them are joiners extras. Oh, jo- sorry, joiners regulars. So was, was that literally a gamble you took on the day you turned up? You just said, look, we'll just see what's yeah, to well, stay we, around. We, yeah, we had the permission of, obviously, the, the owners. Yeah. And the owners were doing their bit to say, right, well, we'll stay open. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's that thing of having to improvise. If there, were, if there was no one in there, obviously, we'd have made it tighter shots. And, mm. I mean, most of the activity is, like, in the toilet, and then he goes out to the bar, and it's mostly on him and Lorenzo. Mm. Um, but yeah, we were, I mean, if you see those scenes, uh, we were pretty, it was great because I recognised some of those characters in there. You know, they were always in there, in and, in and around. So it was, it, it was, it's great to film in those, you know, it just blurs the line um, between, you know, what what's, what's real and what isn't. Um, if you can get away with shooting in as many sort of real locations and and what's what's the challenge there with that kind of approach with with shooting on film because obviously film isn't as readily easy to shoot with yeah, as, so, digi- as digital is today so this no this... so this was so so it was we we were in a good position actually so David Higgs who it was two DOPs on it it's David Higgs and Dale McCready right um, David Higgs, David Higgs had just come from doing the new Guy Ritchie. So it just wrapped on, I think it was Rock and Roller. That's right, yeah. So he had a good relationship with Fuji at that time. He'd just come and, uh, uh, you know, shot the new guy, Richie. Fuji were happy. So he's like, look, I want to do this tiny little thing. We're going to shoot it in 11 days. You know, can you do me a deal? And and David had his own film camera. So we got an amazing deal on the Fuji stock. Mm. Um which was an amazing stock. And then it was very, it was very, I was very sort of, again, I was talking about the workshop process. So we knew, so we knew that script inside out or, or those scenes Mm. around those scenes. It wasn't, it wasn't ever tied, you know, there's always improvisation right up to on the day. There was always improvisation. Um, And obviously, you know, if you're working with, you know, actors, who are good at improv, then that's fine. But if you're working with people that are non-actors, then that's not so good, you know, mm. sometimes, you know, to, you can get them to be spontaneous once, but they can't keep riffing um, 
on stuff. Whereas someone like Ricky Grover, also stand up comic, is incredibly good at keep coming up with different stuff. Oh, right. Okay. You know? Yeah. Because yeah, he's yeah. used to being on stage and just thinking on his feet and, Got you. and just having you in fits of laughter. So we had a certain amount of film stock daily. But as we went along, we were being so good with it that, mm. that by, by, you know, the fourth day or the fifth day, we started to get more. So we could, we could then do longer takes and right. everything else. You know, you can, you can do your long takes. It just depends on, you can't just, I mean, that's the luxury of shooting on digital. Obviously you can just let it run. There's no, there's, there's I mean, no I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing a big influence is, is the kind of Nouvelle Vague and, and, and cinema variety, you know, the, you know, a lot of it feels like we're documenting, not filming, you know, in, in certain yeah. senses. It's it's almost like, you know, you've given you give the film an energy, which is even when you're in the confines of his flat, it still feels yeah. run and gun all the time. You know, you you kind of you, you, you it, there's a breathlessness to it that that, that that drama doesn't always have. One of the biggest big influences was Summer on the Estate. I don't know if you saw that documentary, no. Summer on the Estate. No, no, set no. In the, and King King's Mead Estate in um in that area, it's, right. it's, been, it's all been it's all been knocked down now. But um, I think it's it's readily available on on YouTube. But there was a certain atmosphere, and also it was very um, fly on the wall, and it was a lot of different, very fascinating, interesting characters in that documentary. And it became very influential for for a lot of people uh, uh, <laughs> of of our age and around that got area. You. You, got you, got you. Uh, it was one of those, it was, I think it was on like, I think it was first shown on ITV, like on a Sunday evening and just everyone watched it, you know, and okay. everyone used to sort of quote from it and stuff. So there was, there was obviously, there was a lot of um, documentary influences as well as, as film. And then stuff like Nighthawks, you know, the Ron Peck. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Film just capturing that atmosphere of, of, you know, Tony around those bars and streets and everything else. So I've been listening yeah. to um Jason Bailey's Fun City Cinema podcast, which is a which is a podcast that accompanies his book, which is about the history of cinema in New York. And a lot of what they talk about about the films is about how certainly the 70s films in New York is the city was a character. And I think that's yeah. you you you've made Dalston and, and and the bits of Soho that you go into. An extension yeah. of Tony, haven't you? It's not. It's not yeah, just like absolutely. here's a scene and a location. No, no, no. Funny enough, on Saturday I walked past Tony's flat and it's being demolished. Um, oh, really? The, yeah, the flats. Yeah, they've they've got all the police. Um, you know, they've cornered it all off, so it's going to be knocked down in, in the next month or so. Blimey, O'Reilly. Um, so, what, yeah. what's the challenges there when you're with you, you and um, you and David sort of shooting like that, where? Where you, you, it's the real environment. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no help with it. It's just like you, the locations you've got are are the are, are what you've got to deal with, haven't they? Yeah, and also like having to get out of. But I mean, we we, I mean, the police were called a few times to various. You know, we were in the phone boxes doing the phone box scene. The police turned up and said they were junkies because obviously, as well, I like a lot of long length, long length stuff and staying. You know, and where we were always behind Tony, there was a lot of a lot of people were reacting to Tony as if he was this guy, you know, mm. in cafes, in bars, people giving abuse to him um, just by seeing this weirdo, because obviously he did look very strange. With his what, little so bag so you're shop. talking, your man and woman on the street are giving him abuse. Not yes. just, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And also that, that I mean, it's a bit naughty really, but the scene where Davey's mum is looking for, Little Davy, yeah, yeah. None of those. They all thought that he'd gone missing, right? Okay. I mean, obviously, once we wrapped that little uh, section, we we went up to tell people that we were filming this, but to 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 sort of get the real reaction of people, she just went around and said, "Look, have you seen this little boy?" My word. Okay, that's a, that's yeah, a high, that's a high gamble, now, isn't it? Yeah. Now I've got kids. I don't think I'd want to. I'd, I'd be. <laughs> I'd be wanting to frighten people like that, but there you go. But, yeah, 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 yeah. It was just, but it was, again, it's just about shooting. We were so guerrilla. You know, as I say, we would turn up at places like, for instance, the charity shop and just, I would go, I love the look of this place. Let's get Tony buying a tyre for his interview, you mm. know, and he'd just walk in and we'd just, we'd just walk in behind him. 
you know. Um, and that's some, what, we, what I noticed there with a lot of these scenes where it, you 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 give yourself the flexibility to be fast and shoot where because there's no di- there's there's no dialogue is there? So for a filmmaker listening in is to see those scenes and how much they achieve with nothing being said. Yeah, and they, they was you know I remember the, the that that final the final stuff which was me Dow and Peter in the West End. Yeah. You know, we shot all of that nighttime West End stuff. We were out there on a Friday night, um, walking around the West End. And apart from the occasional people that would shout something, most people just didn't take any notice of because mm. uh, it was just three of us, you know. Um, and obviously I wasn't near Peter was ahead, Dow was there, I was a little bit to the to the left of him. So people are so busy looking at other stuff. Mm. You know, and getting on with their nights or or going to the next bar, and yeah, so it was uh, it's great. But the whole film was pretty much shot like that. I mean, obviously we had locations like the pub and the flat and everything else, but there was we were always ready, three sixty. We were always ready to just you know make up something on the spot if we needed to. What 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 what? Can you give an example of something that's in the film that you, that is is a made up on the spot moment that became? Well, yeah, the, 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 as I said, the um, charity shop was totally. I just said, "What a great, what a great charity shop!" Because we because we were filming in the in the um, sunbed shop next door. Okay, okay. And then it's just about right. Okay, well, he does need to get smart for this uh, <laughs> sunbed shop. Maybe a nice little tie for his job. You know, when he's standing doing the doing the sign, which don't really exist anymore, do they? The golf signs, golf sale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, they yeah. I used to work on, to a lot of that. I used to work on Tottenham Court Road. They were a regular yeah, feature. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there was always those little um, happy accidents, you know, where you could just where you could just do that, where you could just say, okay, let's just film this. Now, now um, the elephant in the room talking about um, Tony is obviously the, the man that plays the titular character. Um Peter F- F- Ferdinando. Ferdinando. Um, now he's in the short, so obviously he was always going to be Tony. Yes. And 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 then given that you use the workshop approach to developing it, what what is it about Peter, and what and what was it that you that Peter brought to the character that you were, you couldn't have imagined? You know, is there, is there elements of choices he made where you were like, yeah, let's go with that? Yeah. Well, I think. Um... Obviously, we we're cousins. Okay, uh, Peter and I. So, um, and we're we're similar. We're, we're sort of similar age. Mm-hmm. It's like a year between us. So right. we've we've grown up uh, being sort of very close. Um, and when I initially wanted to do um, my first short film, Peter was. The only person that I felt confident enough to say, "Do you want to do this thing?" I mean, Peter was acting from a young age, right. um, Anna Sher, and then lots of sort of TV and film stuff, like little bits. You know what I mean? Nothing, mm. you know, bit, bits and pieces. Um, but 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 obviously, from from being a child actor, um, so then we did the short, and then Tony was something that we really felt like the short of Tony is is okay. It was shot in a we did it on a bank holiday weekend and, um, it, you know, it's not giving the opportunity. It's not that I, I, I ever had the idea. It was Paul Abbott really that gave me the idea of saying, how would you develop it? How would you like to develop this into a feature? Mm-hmm. I'd already, I'd already been thinking about things like hyena by that point. You know what I mean? I didn't particularly, I just saw it as a little, a, a great little, a short idea, you know, of, mm. of this guy on on a on a council estate killing people. But um, so then it became a real journey of right. Let's do this properly. And and, and Peter lost two stone um, because also I knew the kind of actor he was because we were we we know each other really well. You know what I mean? So yeah, I yeah, knew yeah. that what he could do. So there was no real. Um, pressure on not having Peter play the full, the full blown version. Got it you. was just a a logical progression that we would do it. Now we could now we could have the time and the money 
Um, and also everyone in that film was sort of ex, most of the people there were ex Anna. Do you know Anna Sher, the, the, the acting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. School? yeah, yeah, yeah. L- lots of actors from around North London, East London uh, went, went through her uh, school, but there was a lot of the actors were all part of the same kind of gang, you know, Neil Maskell, Lorenzo, Fra- Fran and George, mm. uh, Mark Mooney, Peter, they were, they were all, Oh, yeah. Anna's. So it became like this little um, collective. And that was good for me as well, because I had this sort of ready-made little um, collective of, of actors and also getting Vicky Murdoch, who was ex-Anna's as well, who was the leading Christine, Alan Clark's um, film. So it was that, it was trying to get that, that continuing that, connection to, to Alan Clark. Okay. Um, which was important to me because obviously he's, he's been a, a, a huge influence um, over the years. So yeah, we just, we just, we just went on the journey with it. But, really. but, but in terms of, of, well, especially then knowing how well you, you obviously know Peter going into making the film, what, what were some of the decisions that you know he's consciously made that you kind of go, yeah, that's, Get, that's taken Tony to. Oh yeah, well, I mean, he moved into the flat and lived there for the duration of the shoot, um, and you know, everyone knew him as Tony in the local shops. I mean, he just immersed himself into. He freaked everyone out that worked on the film, <laughs> the makeup, the makeup people, the hair, the, the uh, costume. They were all terrified of. He <laughs> it, it, it was just. He was Tony for that for the duration. Hmm. Um, He lived on that diet, stayed in that house, talked in that voice. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Freaked freaked everyone out. Yeah, it was great. I mean, you know, he's Mark Mooney, who's in the film, who's an old friend of pieces, didn't recognise him on the first day of shoot. My word. And he's known him, like, for 20 years, you know, (laughs) didn't recognise him. So we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Well, like, um, but there's some nice, like, wardrobe details even. Like, I noticed this this watch through, obviously, getting ready to talk to you. Like, he's wearing strap-over shoes, isn't he? Yes, yeah. I mean, that's such a... Funny enough, he found, he was having a clear-out, and he found the old Tony shirt and all, all the costume right. uh, last year. And he said, what do you think? Are we going to revisit? I said, no, I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think we are. <laughs> are we going to bring Tony back? I mean, but but like I said, early doors. I mean, one of the things that I think is quite magical about it as a film is that clearly it makes no apology about it being about a man who's indiscriminately killing people. But mm. but you, because we're doing it from his point of view and because of how he is and the life he has, the film plays this horrible trick on us as an audience that we begin to empathise with him. Whether we like it or not, there are mo- there are obviously there are the jarring moments that stop us. But in this, I thought it, you know it's different tone, but in the same way that um, Man Bites Dog does it, where for a bit you're kind of laughing, you think it's funny, mm. and then mm. the film in, in Man Bites Dog, the film asks you the question, "What you're laughing at?" Whereas I feel like you you've managed to have your cake and eat it in some senses that you get to horrify us, and then you get to make and you keep. Like like a game of tennis, you bounce back and forth between the two, which I think is is really a real a real testament to the film. I think. Well, and also is that um, you know we see what's wrong with how society is treating him. You know, from the job centre to the to the to the tan shop hmm. to everyone in society. You know, there's no there's no way out for Tony, is there? He exists in that world. He's got his little pleasures of watching videos and eating his crappy diet. Hmm. But there's no, there is no escape. And, you know, we're not saying, we don't know how intelligent he is, but we're saying that he's slipped through the net. He has no way of getting out of his situation anymore. Hmm. There's no help. There's no help for him in any way, shape or form. So I'm not saying that that should make you into someone who is like Tony, but 
when we can understand, and especially with the with the, with the um, what's happened in his past with his with his father and stuff, we can sort of understand how someone can get to where Tony is. Mm, no, for sure. Um, and exist. And also is this idea of big cities and, and how we're never sure of who we're passing in the street. And we've all seen Tonys. We've all, I mean, you, the amount of times I still see Tonys mm. and walking with their little bag, blue bags of shopping yeah. um, hunched over, you know, and you wonder about, their lives or you I mean yeah it's, it's an absolute coder isn't it I mean it's it's interesting that something as simple as almost like rounded shoulders and a blue black blue, blue clarion bag hanging by hanging by the hip is a sign of you know it is a it does give well us- not necessarily but ju- but just that those you know lost lives or lives that are sad lives you know people that have gone through stuff um not necessarily you know they they they're up to what Tony's up to but just the, the- <laughs> You know, especially as I say, when you're living in, in a city full of millions of people, you're always drawn to those people that. Oh, I wonder what's happened to them. I, I mean, you're you're you're. Are you born and bred London? Yes. Yeah. You see, so I'm, I'm I've only been in London twenty years, and I don't know how you I don't know how you how you see London from the inside looking out, but certainly from the outside coming in, it's the it is one of the few places where you can vanish. If I go for a walk around Manchester, I never feel like I can vanish. Whereas, like yeah. I did it the other day, I came back from visiting friends in Marlow. I got off the train at so Paddington, nice. and then I walked from Paddington to Bond Street. Yes, and that's just you know just a, yeah, that's a pretty pleasant part of town. But but you just did, you were invisible. I was invisible, you know. That and you're passing people who are equally and you know the equally as inconsequential as I was, and that because there's so many of you. And then you're surrounded by like built up, you know, you've got dense housing and you've got lots of cars, even, you know, even though we're, we're at the tail end of a pandemic and it's not as busy as it was, it still is intense London and it's very easy to be invisible. And therefore, once you're invisible, yeah. it's it's very easy to be ignored. Absolutely. And that, and that's, yeah, the the, the fascination with me with, the, with those, you know, invisible societies or invisible areas that we're not really privy to. And that's also what I carried on into Hyena was all of those, you know, in West London, all of those secret little societies and, and areas, you know, the different different makeup of criminal gangs, what areas they're from, how the code is different. Just any, any yeah, yeah, I must admit, I could, I could, I must admit, I've never walked down the Edgware Road before. And the Edgware Road has yeah. got an identity. Yes. Oh, it's, it's, uh, I love it. In fact, I'm working on something at the moment and, um, um, me and the writer went and went and sat uh, on on the Edgeway Road like two weeks ago, and yeah. just just to soak in, you know, just to chat and stuff. But um, yeah, I love it. I love how, and I used to do. I used to be a bike courier. I used to on bike messenger, whatever you call it, years mm. ago. And I just um, always it, it, what what was good about. I mean, it was a horrendous uh, job, really. Um, mm. Just just, but but what was good, I, I got. I got to see so much of London, like even like I, I thought I knew London, but actually when you're a courier, you get to see so much that you've never seen mm. and you realize, but also what's interesting is you, your, how your mood can change from one street to another. And I know that's like that with a lot of places, but it really is like the difference between, yeah, I would, I, some, there would be no reason other than me just going, why do I feel like I'm, you know, a bit depressed <laughs> just at this point. Yeah. And then you would get to obviously areas, as I say, like you go to somewhere like Edgware Road and it's so sort of, um, it almost feels like you're abroad, you know? Yes. You're somewhere yes. like, like it's it's so like uh, it, the smells are different. And I love that. I love the fact that you can just go to, you know, you could go to somewhere like Vauxhall and just have Portuguese or it, it's, you know, there's so many different areas and there's so many different, um, you know, cultures, mm. um, which is, which and I think, is and I think it's, it definitely shows in, but obviously in both both Tony and Hyena that that idea of wanting to use the built environment as part of your film. But it, obviously, the important thing there is about it's not it's not showing everything. It's about what the camera frames, isn't it? Yeah, but and also just showing London as as very cinematic, mm. um, which um, yeah. 
um, I've, I always felt was a bit lacking. Uh, as a, a, in in comparison to Paris or New York, I always felt London was always never as utilised, and I think it is as arch- architecturally interesting as those places. It's just, it's just, I don't know. Um, maybe it's just people don't have that fascination with it as much. Maybe UK filmmakers don't have that. Uh, fascination with location shooting. I'm always, but I guess, I guess, if you're going to spend, I mean, I guess London, if you're not doing it guerrilla style, is an expensive place to shoot. And unless people can recognise it's London, like there's yeah. the icon, there's the Houses of Parliament, and there's <laughs> yeah, there's St exactly. Paul's. Yeah. Have you shot in London, yeah. so to speak? Whereas you being a Londoner, you you're seeing it, you're seeing the interesting things of London from the point of view of what's interesting, not what makes what makes the rest of the world recognise it as London. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm working on something at the moment that's um, period oh, London. Yeah. And that's tricky because I'm thinking once we, 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 when we get, we get to shoot that, that's, you know, all my, all my normal techniques are going to be out the window, aren't they? They <laughs> are, yes. Like, You're going to need a bit like, of window dressing. Do? I can't, we, we can't, we can't just go and follow one of the characters around the West End or around, around East London. Hmm. A it, a, it doesn't exist, but yeah. So it's that's going to be a that's going to be a, a sort of challenge of how how you make it still very much in that very fluid style, but obviously uh, period. Mm. But we'll see. But it can be done now with the with the re- the social realism element of of that's very evident in Tony. It was interesting that there was there's a I felt like this was more heightened than than, than real the the whole drug deal dealer layer. And, and the poem that's recited at him and stuff that that was suddenly very heightened after after what felt like a well and what is yeah, well, either right. side so, of it. So, so that guy um, was the real, completely the real deal in in all areas, um, without going into too much detail. So he used to he used to uh, you know read those poems, hmm. right? and I knew him. I knew him from the, the Shoreditch area, right. Um, non act he'd never acted before he never obviously he's total real deal hmm. um he went off and i think uh, afterwards my casting director cast him in i think the first top boy he was in oh really um but yeah so it was just again all these little things i was like i've got to get you in the in the film um with your little poems because he just used to read his poems out in the middle of nightclubs in the middle of you know, shortage at like four in the morning. Okay, okay. <laughs> so yeah, um, and a couple of those guys in the in that layer um, have since OD, since died of um, drugs. Right. So, so that's yeah. we're talking about the, the the dealer guy. We're talking about is it Cyrus Desir or Deserve? Yes. Um, but that whole setting is. Is, that wasn't built then. That that you found that location. No, no, no that was a, that was a real. Um, it was like a stroke rave, like venue. Um, ah, okay. Over over in sort of Seven Sisters, it was like full of, and the guy the guy that ran it died shortly after we. Um, he died of an, an overdose shortly after we um, we wrapped. Mm. Um. So, yeah, that was that was a great. It, so it was a, it was like a illegal nightclub, right? Illegal. Okay, okay. Which, yeah, which, he, he, which again speaks to the times, doesn't it? Because there aren't, yeah, there aren't no, many venues. No, none of that was set set dressing. We just turned up, and it was like like it was. And I was like, "Let's just film as is." You don't. Bloody hell, do that's magical! Because it look, honestly, from from watch, yeah. certainly watching it with today's eyes, it it looks dressed. No, none of it. None of those chairs. Nothing. We didn't bring any. Got to realize we didn't. We didn't really have much money for them. I mean, we did the it, Tony's flat. We did quite a bit on, hmm. um, and that was it. We didn't nothing else. Um, it was Tony's flat was the focus, you know, with the brown wallpaper and just making it. Um, but anyway, it was already pretty rough and ready. Tony's flat. We just we just helped it a little bit along, hmm. you know, put some more more grease on the walls and stuff. But it was pretty. It was pretty there already. But yeah, that place was. Absolutely, as we turned up, 
and that we didn't we didn't do a thing. Well, we let's take it back then, thing. honestly, yeah, because it's it's sort of it, it, in the midst of the film, it feels almost like a fantasy element to it. But obviously, yeah, I think that a little area where they're sitting was like the chill out area for the, yeah, for the yeah. club. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, they had yeah. a pot plant there, they had a sofa, a couple of chairs, so people could just. Like plop down. Well, you know, you know, they, you know like in the way Carpenter does it in Escape to New, New York, it's like those, yes. it's that kind of yeah. lair, isn't it? You know. Yeah, it was honestly how we found it. I go, it's probably lovely flats now, I imagine. Um, I don't imagine it's still there. I mean, when when Smudger, when Smudger says that, uh, <laughs> Smudger comments on the state of Tony's flat, you know, you know you've got a bad flat. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great moment that the idea... It's the smell. It's it's like an old. It's all yeah. right. It's like an old person's flat. And then yeah, I'll, and- I'll, I'll put, I'm not old. Um, what we did as well. I got some from from Kingsland Road. I got some offal. Um, I bought some offal about two weeks before um, mm. we were going to shoot. Mm. Uh, so it's eleven day shoot, and I and I put it in an airtight. You know, one of those parcel bags. Yeah, yeah. The, you, know, you know, parcel bag. I I put this off on in a parcel bag and left it. Uh, I was working in post. No, no, I, I, I leave it. I was working anyway. I I, I left this bag of um, offal, and then when we first day of shooting, I opened it up in in the flat, so it just stunk the 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 flat out, um, and obviously it get, got into everyone's. Um, because that that was the thing with Nielsen, wasn't it? It was the smell. I mean, mm. it was the dra- drains, obviously, but the smell of that place, you know, of rotting flesh. Yeah, he's not alone. So I, I think John Wayne, next- John Wayne Gacy got was was got yeah. found out by that as well, didn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. That that when a- anyone comes in to the flat and says, "Oh, that stinks," it's because it it did. It really stunk. only only Dawn, Vicky Murdoch. She's the only one. It, it, she's the polite one, and it's just so lovely that. You, you know, she sees the porno mags, the tissue box on a table, and she says, you live alone? <laughs> it's such a and great it line. funny, you know, um, as well. That's like how I would do stuff, like how I was doing stuff then to, to uh, uh, you know, it, just to cut the dialogue out mid midway through that and just, just have the music coming. Mm. Um, I just look back at that and think, um, well, it's quite a, interesting thing I did there, you know, just, just, but that thing of like, oh, let's just cut this dialogue now in the middle of, in the middle of a conversation yeah, and just have the, cause it's all about their connection anyway. It's not about what she's saying to him. Exactly. And, um, and, and he does, and it's one of the, it's one of the few moments because when he has the conversation, a DVD seller he's being nice, but he's getting nothing back. Whereas suddenly he's invited somebody to his home who is interested in him, not interested in what he can get. And, Peter's responses are all are, are kind of like he's guarded, but he's he's there's a smile like he's this is a happy moment in a weird way in a film about a serial killer. This is a happy moment. This is like and the whole like cute moment over Brussels sprouts. Even you know it's such a such a minutiae point, but in that little fleeting moment, there's he's living his best life. I think at that point, totally. yeah. Oh, it's lovely because she's nice to it. And uh, we did film another scene with Dawn. Um, at, at, and Tony at a tenants meeting, which was oh, quite did, funny. Th- that gets mentioned, yeah. So at a, a tenants meeting, um, yeah, that's there's loads of people arguing about kids playing football on the estate, and Tony's just gone there really to have the free biscuits. You know, he's just yeah, yeah, he's yeah. just sitting, just sitting there. In the, do, do you think? Do you think, think he ever went to the for the roast dinner? Well, Paul Abbott, Paul Abbott always wanted to shoot the roast dinner with Dave and the oh, kids. Oh man, yeah, but. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's nice for us to just think maybe he did. I think maybe he did. I think he did. Yeah, maybe. He so did. look, yeah. let's let's just jump to you were left alone to the edit. So you've had this wonderful experience of developing a script and you've been gorilla shooting it and you've got the you know, you've created this character and you've made a you've given us a cinematic view of London. Um and then you get into the edit and and now you've got other influences on you that are the people that have got stake in the film because this is where we go from what you've got to what the world will see, isn't it? I suppose that's the important part of this process. Yeah. So yeah. what what became that? How involved did that become? And how did that that part of the process begin to shape what eventually became the film, Tony? You know, it it was the structure. It was it was very much vignettes. 
and it was Tony's journey. And mm. it was became what, uh, uh, whose little interaction with Tony became more important or, or was, was, was stronger. Um, mm. So as I say, there was a few things that, that a few characters that were left um, that were cut out. But um, I suppose then it became, yeah, it was the first time I'd really come into contact with hardcore notes okay. you know, from from the film council. Um, when when you've not experience of that, how, what 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 do you remember? Uh, yeah, what do you yes. remember? What do you remember being your response? To, like what like R- ripping it all up in a rage? Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> do they know who I am? Oh, it's not even that. It's just like you. Obviously, you you're so. You're so, it's so you. That film is so you. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. almost like opening up your diary to someone and them saying you can't feel like this on this day. You know what I mean? You, you, oh, you okay, okay. So, I, I always feel anyway when you make a film, it's you, you can't help but get too emotionally involved with it okay. uh, because you've seen it. Especially if you're the writer director, you know maybe it's different if someone else has written it and you're just directing it, or you've just written it and someone else is directing it. You've all, but. I, because you've you've created those characters, you've seen them through it, you've then filmed it, you're in, in the edit. I mean, obviously you learn, obviously you learn now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not like that. Um, I'm used to notes now, you know what I mean? But this mm. was the first time I remember, yeah, I took it personally. Um, okay. What do they mean? What do they mean he's no good? What do they mean that needs tightening? You know, every little bit. But you got to re- as I say, you got to realize that's the first time I'd, I'd ever got notes, and these notes are uh, are meant for for you know people that <laughs> someone probably should have told me. Look, just, yeah, just yeah, yeah. chill out. Which so I, I, I learned pretty quickly that that's that's the way of the world. So what, I'm, um, out of interest, how much of the notes were to do with the moral ambiguity of the film? Because obviously the film isn't obviously an advert for killing, but clearly it isn't also saying no, killing no, is bad. No, I don't think it was. I mean, look, I can't, I, I honestly can't. It was so long ago. Because um, as well, like this is, we shot that film in 2007. Right. Um, so it was two years. Um, and I was, I went off and um, was doing tele sales, which became the, a, a big part of what I wrote about in um, Muscle. Muscle, yeah. But, but during that time, we were editing it sort of weekends when we could, me and my editor, Ian Davies. And eventually we got into Edinburgh. So that meant that I could leave my job that afternoon and, and, and do the film properly and finish it and everything else. So those notes were coming over that two-year period, I guess. But I, it's... it's it's. Can you remember any... I mean, obviously there's stuff that made you angry, but do you remember any notes that actually helped well, you mean, make the film? Only- do you when it? I say angry, it was it was like the initial. I remember just the initial first lot of notes. Do it every t- do it every time, Jared. When I get notes on a script, you kind of like, what do you mean? Of course but, you do. Of course. And you then you do. let it yeah, sink yeah. in, don't you? And you kind of no, you let it. Yeah. So yeah. Do, do you remember I mean, any? Do you remember any notes that that became important to what it what the film become though? Does anything stand out? Not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay then. In the edit. What what did you find about Tony that you didn't see going into the shoot? What did it? What did the story reveal itself to be that that changed from how you'd? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I think I think it was it was it was a lot more. Um, I I think it said a lot more about society than maybe we we thought about at the time. I mean, mm. I was aware of it, you know, the, the the social aspect of it, but I think it was. I think what came out of it was a, the poignancy and the and the sadness of it a little bit more, mm. uh, as well as you know the humour. As I said, like we 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 didn't. In, I think with a short, we didn't intend to make a a comedy, but then the out of out of the the, the film, it just lent lent itself more to that. Um, but also, yeah, I just felt like there was um. A little bit of the sadness of the character um, came through the melancholia of um, who he is and, and what and what is made. And then, and then I do think that we did have discussions about putting in um, the father voiceover. So that wasn't okay. written in the script. So that was more to do add more um, to maybe him. So I mean, there probably was notes, but I don't think there was anything along the lines of we need to make him. 
you know, less sympathetic or more sympathetic. Mm. But but you but you I and think your, it was but, just. But I was thinking you and your editor. What did you? What you know? You you've got a discovery to make, and obviously, like you say, you've begun to see all this this idea that you've actually made a, you're making a bigger comment on society than just following a serial killer around. You know that that the poignancy of the film is must have been quite magical to see that you've got this. You know, and but but story wise, because obviously you got you wrap you wrap you wrap Tony around the story of a missing kid, and and obviously where the world believes that Tony is the obvious candidate for doing it, he's the nonce as as he keep, as Ricky Gover's character calls him from the moment he sees him. So on an estate, while he's invisible in London, on the estate, he's that guy, whether he, <laughs> whether he likes it or yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then just, I think we were trying to see how much, well, we shot all that. I think we may have done a pickup shot of the little boy being delivered back to um, the estate. Okay. You know, we had, we, we had the phone call with, um, Reynolds to say that the kid has uh, mm. been returned, but I think there was more emphasis on on the the little boy. You know, mm. there was a there was a few inserts of of like the little boy being returned to to, to sort of emphasise it a little bit more. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything that we did in in pickups to sort of work on what it was. Um, no, I can't. I, I... I mean, I, I think anyone watching your film who, who, who's trying to learn the craft of screenwriting, I think what your film teaches you is the power of suggestion and, and how little you need yes. to see to understand what's the running narrative. You know, Tony talks to the kid with the football. That's that's his only interaction with the kid. And then the next time we see him, he's walking off with his bag. Now, we don't know anything's happened. And then a couple of scenes later, the kid is missing. Now, we've seen Tony kill, so... I don't even think we as the audience are suspicious, but in that way, that puts us on Tony's. That helps puts us on Tony's side when or yeah. when when the accusing eyes are on it. And and Ricky Grover's character is really interesting because in a way you you capture something else there, which is like the impotent rage of a of a lost parent, you know. And he, yeah. and, he and he needs Tony just to just to get justice, even if Tony didn't do it. It's for him. It's just yeah. somebody to yeah. take yeah. it out yeah. on, yeah. isn't yeah. it? And that's a really interesting sidebar to the film. Yeah, yeah, and it's one that was there, but um, I think we did help it along a little bit and and um, try to emphasise that's where the plot kicked in. Mm. Uh, there was a slight bit of plot. Again, like if I was doing it now, I would be tempted to do so much more. Um, just, just well, for, for various reasons, but I'm so glad that it's that it is what it is. You know, mm. where there is not that uh, pressure on doing anything other than it really is a slice of life. And that's what I think is its strength. You know, it really doesn't. Yeah. And you know, the strength is that, that people will say, well, nothing much happens. And that's the point. <laughs> but luckily it's not three hours but, long. But didn't, I mean? I mean, in a way though, didn't, didn't, isn't that what Scorsese does in mean streets in a way? It's kind of it. it yeah. I mean, there's, there's those little, again, they're like vignettes, aren't they? Yeah, little yeah, stories yeah. of people he grew up with and everything else. But yeah, I just, I, I love the way it's just, because it, that's exactly what I intended it to be. I didn't want it to be um, something that had, you know, loads of plot and it was about the, you know, the detective trying to track down the yeah. killer or. Police procedure. You know I, mean? I, I mean, A, A, we didn't really have the budget, but it was about being truthful to just making a character study mm. and really trying to make it feel an authentic snapshot of, of London during that period. Um, and all the little characters that I'd come across, you know, it was, it, Tony was based on some people I'd known mixed in with like Dennis Nilsson. So it was loads of, it was loads of little bits and pieces that I've made notes with over the years. And it's just throwing everything into mm. the mix and being allowed to do that. And, you know, the film did, uh, very well. Um, and you know, got critically acclaimed, and it, and it and it does just show you that, you know, without any outside influence, that's what you 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 can do. Mm. I mean, and did I mean um, did because obviously something like say Henry Portrait Killer Killer got a lot of flack for being like too too real or too this too the other. Did you was there any was there any sort of reactionary stuff to to the to the piece that you? 
No, only that they kept. I mean, obviously, I loved Henry. It's, it's a masterpiece. Oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, the distributors put on the London serial killer tag, mm. um, which then everyone was then saying, "Oh, it's not Henry Portrait. It's Tony London serial killer. It was only ever sort of Tony." Mm. So it was. It was like, what if Henry existed in in the UK and he and he lived on a shitty diet on a council estate? Yeah. Um, but no, I don't. No, I I I, I don't think there was too much of a, a reaction. Um, really, from what I can remember, um, it was mainly pretty pretty positive. And what would what as a as a first time feature, what what did you? learn from the experience that still stands you in good stead today? Um, to be prepared for the unpreparable. <laughs> no, I'm... <laughs> Look for I'm, black I'm, swans. Is that what you're saying? Look for black swans. <laughs> it, it, well, yeah. No, it's... Um, obviously, it was such a learning curve um, of doing a feature, but I always looked at it like... Um, it was just an extended short, you know, because we were only doing it for 11 days. It yeah. was like, right, it's going to be like this. And that, because I had the scenes set up where they were like little shorts with various actors, as I say, the actors could come and go hmm. and only see their scenes because they weren't in other scenes. Yeah. Um, you know, so Dawn did her bit, Lorenzo did her bit, um, George and Fran did their bit. So everyone came in and, and had their little section of the script. And able to shoot um, chronologically, which is tough because now, you know, when you've got to do nights and you're working on big, a bit more locations. I mean, I went from doing that to doing Hyena, which had like, you know, hundreds of different locations. Mm. Um, it became such a nightmare to then take, um, you know, to do exactly how that would have um turned out but obviously the workshop process is something that I very much hold dear and it's something that I really did um intensively on that yeah and still do but it to a less intense um level I guess because that was over six months whereas now it's condensed to a few weeks um what what know, are the main benefits for you for workshopping as opposed to as opposed to writing scripts for people to then respond to no, I do that as well. So the workshop, there's always, a, I always write the script. See, Got that's you. the difference. It's not like it's, it, nothing's devised out of the workshop. Okay. That's not what it, that's not what it is. It's, I, I, I write everything and then we'll bring it in to, to go over everything. So we might look at the, we, we, we'll look at pages and we'll, we'll read, but we'll talk about the characters and it'll be the development of the characters. Okay. That's what it will be. So it'll be, it's it, it works for a number of reasons. It's 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 we we get a shorthand, the actors and I get a shorthand. Um, uh, so we'll get to know one another, so that when we're on set, it's uh, it's it's easier because we they know what I want and mm. I know what they want, and then we'll we'll develop stuff. We may change things. I mean, I don't think there was a hell of a lot changed on muscle really. Um, to what to what I, I came in with the script, there might be certain things that Craig or, or Cav may have come up with, mm. um, but it's pretty much it's pretty much on the page. But that's not sometimes that's not what it's just about. It's about going in and having the time to chat and just talk. Well, I guess a, I guess you're in, you're in, you're the creator, so in a way, they if if they can understand your intent. You can begin yeah, to shape I mean, that, can't you? Because if you don't know your intent, then what am I trying to achieve is, is often exactly. quite hard. It's, isn't it's it? in, yeah, it's incredibly important, and especially my films have a certain atmosphere and 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 uh, are, you know uh, they exist in a certain immersive environment. So when I'm on on set, it's quite immersive into that world. Yeah, um, Tony was hyena is muscle is you're immersed in that world um, for the. For the for the duration, really, mm. I try and keep it. I try and keep everyone um, on a, a in in that world, you know, in mm. that world, and and, it, and it's quite um, an exciting um, journey that we go on. And so that to to do that work beforehand um, is yeah, it's vital for us mm. to all have that understanding, and also it. it, it it gets rid of, you know, if there's any sort of funny business, 
say you don't connect with an actor or or something, then there's time to correct it. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's an expensive <laughs> thing to find out on set, isn't it? <laughs> well, exactly. And you don't want, you know, you've got to go into a film. It's, a, it's, it's like, it's that huge undertaking you've got to do. It takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of hard work. Um, and you, but you want to ultimately really enjoy it. You want to be excited every day. You're going, you, you don't want to have to have egos that, that mm. are out of control or things that are going to ruin that mo- that precious time for you. Mm. Um, sometimes there's things that happen that you have to do on the spot. But something like that, where you just you and your actors have that connection, that's um, I just I just see that as very um, just a vital part of the process. Now, to end on a, on a, on a, on a high note then, so what, what would you, what's a, what's a favourite memory from the Tony shoot that you want, that you can share with us? Well, there were so many, I mean, just like, you know, again, like being, knowing that I was shooting a feature on the streets, hmm. you know, in those locations on film, it was so, um, I keep saying that word, but so liberating at that time, Mm. Um, you know, to be doing exactly how I intended and not, you know, there's a lot of times people make their first film and the second film and suddenly they're involved with people who are stifling their vision or, or telling them they can't do this. And they're suddenly they're getting more stressed. And I don't remember feeling particularly stressed at all during the um, Mm. Tony shoot. And I remember like first day jitters, but I don't remember feeling any, like, like obviously I was just so, yeah, elated and high to be, to be doing something bigger than a short, mm. you know, with, with good people behind me where I was well prepared, where I'd done lots of workshops and I just felt very empowered to do this little unusual film for, for what was a tiny budget. But for me at that time, mm. It was it was a luxury, you know, to have anything other than, you know, like two people mm. <laughs> doing everything, me helping with the shooting it. It felt like um, a real luxury at that time. So yeah, yeah, I just have fond memories. No, it's great. No, and, and, and it, goes, it goes without saying that I'm a I'm a huge fan of the film and 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 and, and, and of your subsequent work. And but I just think going back to Tony, it's. It just has that. It has a resonance because I mean, because of the conversation you have had about the, you trying to treat London cinematically, as opposed to let's spot London in the film. It really, it really shows in in the way in the energy of the film because it's about it's about Peter's character, not about knowing we're in London. And yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that makes yeah. it such a, such an interesting film. And obviously, the longer we get away from when it was made, then it I becomes know. a social history document of a London that's long gone now. <sighs> It's just so weird, as I said, as I said to you before. But just going around Soho now, and I miss, you know, there, there's something about. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, they, when, whenever you go to a city mm. around a red light district, is always where the best bars are, the best clubs are. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. always what. But uh, you know, you, you Soho now, there's there's none of it left. It almost feels. I mean, Soho, you've still got a few good pubs. You've still, but. It's it's chain after chain after this. Mm. The soul has gone. The same as in New York now. If you go to Greenwich Village, there's, there's something missing that was there, like even up to nineties and early two thousand. I mean, I can't. I mean, I've only lived here twenty years, and I feel it. I can't imagine what it's like to have lived here all year, to be born and bred here to see how it's had that ripped out. Of oh, I, I mean, I remember when I was a young, like still a school kid, and we, you know, me and my mates would sometimes go up to Soho. It was. It was an edgy, edgy place. Yeah. Know? And we were school kids. We were like 15, 16. But, you know, it's the same with King's Cross, I guess. I mean, King's Cross now. Although I, I think what they've done with King's Cross, it absolutely looks stunning. So mm. it, 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 it really, they, it was not that brilliant um, how it looks to begin with. But Soho, it's a shame because, yeah, there are still pockets of, of, of places and, and the characters are still holding on. But they're few and far between, and once they're gone, you can't then bring those back, mm. which is a shame. So you know the pubs and everything else. It does feel that 
it's less and less of those places. So we've still got to just go and support the ones that are there. That's the thing. But yeah, just looking at that end shot and seeing just by Brewer Street and all around there, it's totally gone now. I mean, you've still got a couple of little places, but it just, you, there was a, as I say, it's always the same with, with, you know, New York or all those big cities. That, that Those areas are always the most vibrant, always the most full of energy. And once you start just developing them into something else, you lose that. I don't, I, I feel it's in some ways it's still the same, but then it's, um, it has changed. It feels, it feels safe there now. On, on that bright light, I will say thank you very much for giving your time to talk, to talk and remember making Tony. It's a fantastic film. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, I, 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 um, I deliberately, I don't know whether that was a good thing or not, but I deliberately didn't look on any, I didn't want to, familiarise myself with anything or I just was going to go into it cold rather than start looking at old do you know what I mean because I wanted to be jogged by as you were talking to me rather than me just reading off something like just 